I'm sitting in my bad side. I have a good side and a bad side. I'm not used to, I might, I might just be sitting like this, Hillel, don't we, take it personally. We could switch, but we wanted everyone to see you. We so can't, that was I've the, already asked. That was the, <laughs> well, Noah, you said things that were very profound. First of all, thank you for your kind words. It's uh, true. Thank you. It's true. I mean, very much. there are a lot of organizations in, in the world that don't do what they said they're going to do, and you, and you do. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Look, you know, we, we, um, uh, you, we saw each other in Israel this summer. Uh, you were very kind to host me uh, on a short notice. I happened to be in Israel. You just flew in from California, and you hosted me at your close friend's house, and we did a, a promotion together, which yeah. was really sweet of you. And now it's I have like the occasion. It's like a different world, right? A different world, it was. Now I have the occasion to host you in my hometown with 320 of my closest friends. So. Pleasure to be here. Um, so, you know, Noah, you, you talked about some very profound topics, the most profound indeed. Um, but I want to, before we come to the heavy topics, um, I want to give people a chance to get to know you, if that's all right. Um, you have a tremendous following on social media, and people know your performances that you've done from Israel and the work you're doing in Hollywood. So if I could ask, because your book also has personal stuff, it melds an historical analysis of Israel with autobiographical elements of your childhood, uh, your upbringing, your career in the entertainment business. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, what it was like growing up in Israel. Maybe there's a personal or family story from the book that you could share. Mon Dieu, how long do we have? Um, so I'll try and do it very quickly. I was born and raised in Israel, in Tel Aviv, to a very secular, very um, uh, family from a kibbutz. Basically, my mom is from a kibbutz. My dad is from Jerusalem, four generations in Jerusalem. Very secular, very, very Zionist family. I, was, I always like to say that I was never, I never been to temple before I moved to America. Like that, that's how secular we were. So I, I was kibbutz, raised- Kibbutz royalty, your family's from Diganya, right? Yes. Maybe say a word about my that. My grandmother was uh, one of the founders of the first kibbutz in Israel, so the first kibbutz in the world. My great grandfather moved to Jerusalem in 1922 to start the Ministry of Industry and Trade in Jerusalem. And my grandfather was not only Israel's first ambassador to Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, he was literally the first representative that the entire state of Israel sent to the entire continent of Africa. Africa. So he was there in March of 1956 in Accra before when it was still called Gold Coast, before it was it gained independence from Great Britain because African countries at the time were about to get independence, gain independence, and they contacted Israel because they say, you have been decolonized from Great Britain. Common mistake when people call Israel a colonialist state, like it literally is a refugee state that was decolonized from Great Britain, but don't confuse them with facts. Um, and he, they called on Israelis to help them out. So my, my grandfather was the first person that the state of Israel sent. And he was a diplomat. He actually was in the part of the UN delegation. My mom grew up in Africa and in New York City and all that. So this was something that was in kind of like the air at home, but I didn't care about it. I became an actress at a very young age. That was all I cared about. I wanted to sing, I wanted to act, that, that was all I cared about. And I did pretty well in Israel, in my career, and then I decided to move to America. And I, that was when I realized the lack of knowledge that people have about Israel. That was to me one of the, that was when I went, wait, I'm confused, I'm a liberal, and you're, you're, you're insane. So I was shocked by, not just, no, really, <laughs> like real insane. Not just, I said, it's not just that people don't know anything about Israel. That is totally fine. I don't know anything about the governance system of Denmark, right? But what I saw was how little people know about Israel, yet how many opinions they have about it. I'm like, surely if you don't know anything about a country, you'll shut up about it, right? No. 
So I just started talking to people about Israel. So one of the stories actually that I, did, I do write about in the book, and that was one of the most kind of shocking moments that I had, was I was in my early 20s. I started coming to LA. We were hanging out with a group of um, actors and producers and writers and this kind of like young and eclectic group. And there was a girl there. And she, was, she already was one of the most famous actresses in the world, she, tur she ended up, she was at the beginning of her career, but she ended up being, you all know her. Everybody knows who she is. She won every single award. It's like, everybody knows who she is. So she comes up to me one day, and she goes, oh my God, I heard you're from Israel. And I said, yes, I am. And she goes, so how does your family feel about you? And I said, what do you, I think they're, I don't know. I think they're proud. I don't, do you have anything to say? Uh, what, what do you mean? And she goes, you know, that you're modern and everything. That you don't wear all the headgear. And I'm looking at her for real. And I'm kind of going, oh my God. And it immediately dawned on me that she's not an idiot. So there wasn't a problem with her, right? Here's a well-educated, well-meaning young woman that literally thinks that Israel is Afghanistan. And that's when I just found out that I can't shut up. And I just started doing it. So I started becoming an advocate and more and more, I didn't want to get into the details of how, how I'm here, but it was basically because I understood that the problems with Israel is not just a cute Hasbara thing, right? I realized that this is a problem of national security not just for Israel, but for Western civilization and Western culture as we know it. And that was, yes, thank you. And here we are. No, no I think I saw somewhere that one of the incidents that uh, mobilized you was the flotilla yeah. incident. I'll just share with you, I was here in Geneva, I'll never forget it. Um, I believe the date was May 31st, 2010. It's so around then, there was the flotilla incident the Mavi Marmara, the Turkey sent, this IHH group sent so-called humanitarians. They were actually a pro-Hamas militant group. They came looking for a confrontation with the Israeli army. They got their confrontation, and some of them died when they were confronting the soldiers. And the first images were Israel is evil. Eventually, you saw that they had iron bars that they were trying to kill the Israeli soldiers. Take and, guns from them. Take, exactly. And here in Geneva, of course, there was an emergency session right away. Navi Pillay was then the UN rights chief. She condemned Israel for its perpetual disdain for international law. Now she's the head of the UN inquiry on Israel. Of course. Who do you pick? And, uh, I think I did a video about them, about her specifically. What's that? I think I, anyway, yeah. talk about it. Yeah, later. we did a video on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, that was here in Geneva. I remember there was a special session the next day. Israel was condemned, even some of Israel's friends, one ambassador from a friendly country said to me, Hillel, it must be hard for you today given your narrative. I said, no, did you see, did you see the images of these iron bars? And also the around the flotilla, the events of the flotilla, people tend to forget that Egypt also put a blockade on, on Gaza in order to prevent Hamas from throwing rockets and taking over Sinai. So people just, they tend to forget that. It's very convenient. Only Israel, yeah. Maybe you could say a word about that, because that, that was an incident that mobilized you, right? That was an incident that ha started my advocacy. T it turned from being kind of this thing that I do at dinner parties and with friends and as a fun thing. This was when I um, started the first uh, online advocacy and rapid response organization, because what happened was it was the night of the event of the flotilla, and I was uh, at my desk in my office browsing my computer in this new and exciting platform called Twitter, right? I was like, oh my God, this is so cool, right? And I saw that the name Israel was trending in the Turkish language. Exactly. <laughs> By then, I already knew enough to know that this can't be a good thing. <laughs> and I started reading, and what it said was, you know, it, it, they made it sound like Israel, out of the blue and without any provocation, killed nine peace activists that were sailing on top of the love boat like just chilling and I just like, I'm like, this, this doesn't make sense. And of course I realized that, that it wasn't what happened. And I, but I realized at that moment that we have a national problem, national security problem, that this is where fake news becoming reality. And it's a, it's a front line that we need to tackle. So here I am ever since. Well, we're, uh, we're all the stronger and better for it that you're with us in this battle and doing things when I watch you. Um, on screen that when you speak, I say, I 
tell my friends and other experts, I say, there is no one in the world who can look into a camera and communicate Israel's cause and the truth the way that Noah Tishbe does. Nobody. Thank so, you. you, God gave you incredible communication skills. You learned performance, production, modeling, art, um, acting, and I all I love that you called me a supermodel. That was great. <laughs> Never been even close to that, but sure, I'll take it. And you used all of that to, to help the Jewish people and Israel, so very few people do that. Bravo to you, really. Thank you. Thank you. There's now, nothing more important, more interesting, more crucial. There's nothing that's, that's better than doing this, nothing. Amen. Um, your book, which people will get outside. Bestseller, New York Times bestseller list for six weeks now? Amazing. Um, <laughs> Israel, a simple guide to the most misunderstood country on earth. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, Bill Maher, yeah. TV host who's hosted you a number of times, um, he's described it as not your Bubby's history book. What motivated you to write this book? What's been the response? So what the, the reason I wrote the book is because, honestly, I needed this book. I just needed it. I have been doing advocacy for many, many years, like nearly two decades. And every time I would have a conversation with people, they'd be like, oh, saying to me stuff like, you know, oh, my God, it's so bad what Israel's doing to them. Blah, 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 blah. Right? What are those? And we're like, well, actually, it's not exactly the same. And sit down and have a conversation and explain to them, this is where Gaza is, this is where the way, this is the different, whatever, whatever they need to hear. And within a few minutes, they would say, oh my God, this makes so much sense. I did, is there a book I can read? And I knew that there wasn't, not because there weren't and aren't extraordinary books about Israel, because there are a lot of them, and I'm sure you all read a lot of them or most of them, but because I knew that there isn't a book that tells the story of Israel in a way that's easy to understand for people who are not history buffs, for the average reader, for progressives and liberals, for younger people, for t college kids and high school kids. I just knew that it doesn't exist. So I kept looking for that book, and when I realized it doesn't exist, I was like, well, I better write that book then. And uh, it's also the first history book about Israel ever written by a woman. Wow, amazing. Yep. Which, which I didn't realize until I did the book proposal. I'm sure some of you, or many of you, may, written books before you have to do a book proposal, and then you do a competitive analysis. So I do a competitive analysis, and then I write all the amazing with Benny Maurice and, and, and Ari Shavit and Roland Bergman and all the incredible books. And I was like, oh, where are the women? Let me look for the women. Where, where are the women? I called my agent. I'm like, is it possible that there's not? So that excludes, by the way, the biography of Golda Meir. And also there's an his Israeli historian. Her name is Anita Shapira. And she wrote a bunch of books in Hebrew that were translated into English. So, but, you know, no American, none, none that was written in English. Um, and the response, uh, honestly, were extraordinary. <laughs> were extraordinary. Because I knew that there's a constituency for the book. I knew that a book like this doesn't exist. I knew that there were a lot of people that, you know, didn't know that they need the book type of a thing. But I think the moment that things changed for me was um, actually Bill Maher. You've mentioned it before. Because you sit around, writing a book is a very lonely thing. I cleared my desk for about a, almost a year and a half or a year and four months, and all I did was take care of my son and write a book. That's all I did. And you write it on your own, and you kind of like, I think it's good, but I don't know, right? You, you called me to ask a few questions about I the I did. UN. You helped me with the book, yeah. There's a That's whole chapter about the UN there that Hillel helped a lot. You're in the acknowledgments as well. Yeah. Thank you. So, yes. <laughs> I made sure to consult with the experts in every topic, just so I don't mess around, because I knew that one mistake is going to discredit the entire, the entire book. So you write, this, you write this thing alone. It's a very lonely endeavor. And then I started sending it out to people to get blurbs, to get endorsements. And Bill Maher was the first one to endorse it. And I was like, oh, oh, I guess. I guess it worked out, and then a lot of other people endorsed it, so the response were, responded was good. Amazing. Now, look, the, the subtitle is A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth. 
Why do you think Israel is so misunderstood? Oh, I love that question. Okay, so first, so first of all, the, the reason, the, okay. So obviously Israel is not the most misunderstood country on earth, because again, I don't know anything about Bali. Uh, nothing, right? But what I wanted to point out with this title is the discrepancy between how little people know about Israel and how many opinions they have. So that's why I used, I used that. But I also called it a simple guide because what's the first thing that people tell you when you bring the topic of Israel? What do, with the first word? It's so, exactly. Oh my God, it's so complicated, right? That's the first word. And I was saying, I'm here to say, it's not that complicated. It's actually very simple. You ready? The Jewish people deserve the right for self-governance and self-determination in their ancestral land, period. That's it. End of story. Very simple, very simple. Once we've agreed on that, then we can start having a conversation about politics, about politicians, about what policies, it doesn't matter. But that is the baseline that we all have to agree on. And up until recently, it was hard to convince people that there are people that want Israel to not exist on the liberal side of the map. So I would say to people, you know, there's an actual movement that sounds something like this in America, right? It sounds like this. Yeah, but like, is Israel a state, though? Or is it a colonialist endeavor that needs to be dismantled? And I started hearing that like 15 years ago. I said, this is insanity. It's absolute insanity. And now it's, you know, more people actually understand that it's happening. So I hope the, the one good thing that happened on, um, through this disaster is that the Jewish community is galvanized, is united. I feel like, and I hope it's the same for you here in Geneva, that there is a sense, a little bit of an Israeli attitude, right? Yeah? Good, good. It's a little bit of like F you type of a thing, like no, no, no. And I think that is very important to kind of get that, that it doesn't, you know, our grandparents were right. They're always gonna come and try and get us. Now we have a country, we have a military, and we're not gonna sit, and we're not gonna take this quiet. We're not gonna take it lying down. So thank you all for being here. And I know that if you're here, you're in the conversation, you're fighting, you're a part of this. And just by being a part of UN Watch, you're doing a great, great thing for the state of Israel, the Jewish people, and the Western civilization at large. Thank you, Noel. I, I do want to reiterate, certainly we at UN Watch share your opinion that being silent doesn't help. The Jewish people, the, the German Jews tried that, it didn't work very exactly. well. Exactly, not just that. First of all, okay, the Jewish community throughout history have always tried to assimilate, to play along. We have in the community an epigenetic fear of being literally rounded up. So as a result, the Jewish community for many, many years has been like, it's just, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, let's be nice, let's be quiet. Now, you have to understand, this has been going on since the days of the Hellenism. In the land of Israel, the Jews tried to become more Greeks than Greek and were working out hard and like were sewing their foreskins back on to become, more, I'm not kidding, it's terrible, I know, I'm sorry. The boys are cringing right now. but. Herzl wanted the Jews to convert to Christianity, right? That was There's, his original plan. Yes. We have always tried to play along and play nice and be like, let's not ruffle any feathers. We're very successful, but let's just be quietly successful in the corner. And I've been saying this for a very long time. This never works. This never works. To some extent or another, we're always going to be othered, all right? So if we're always going to be othered, May as well be loud and proud about it. May as well be loud and proud about it. Exactly. And if you're not speaking up right now, what are you doing? Uh, Noah, we have a number of young people here tonight. Oh you're yeah, someone... that's great, by the way. Where you're... are they? Where are they? Yes. <laughs> you're, you're someone. That's, this is, I'm talking to you. Being Jewish is fucking cool. It is. Remember that. Sorry. I usually only curse when I speak to like college kids and high school kids because that keeps them awake. 
you, you are looked up by uh, looked up to by many young people. Um, we're in such volatile discourse on American campuses. America used to be the safest place for Jews. It is the opposite of safe for Jews. What advice can you give young people uh, as they try to navigate through this difficult challenge, perhaps the most difficult ever? Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Don't back down. Don't blink. Take a step in, lean in. The thing is this, we live in a world today in which we are encouraged, everybody's encouraged to be proud of their identity. Especially in America and on college campuses, it's like you're proud of, I'm, you know, I'm proud of my ethnicity and my background and marginalized community and my sexual orientation and my veganism, whatever, right? Everybody, everybody's proud of their identity, which is a blessed thing, it's great. But just notice that this was not afforded to the Jewish community. We have not related to ourselves the same way. I would hear a lot of people in America, and again, I don't know if it's the same here, but they would say stuff like, they'd hear I'm from Israel, so they come up to me and go like, oh, you're from Israel, yeah, I'm Jewish too. Well, I'm Jewish, but I'm not like Jewish Jewish. I'm more like culturally Jewish. What does that mean? What on earth does that mean? So that needs to end. So for the younger generation, if I can just inspire one thing, is own the Jewish identity because it's amazing. There's a history that is unparalleled to literally any other culture in the world. And we need to, we, it's also the proof is in the pudding, right? Jews are 0.18% of the world population, but 22% of Nobel Prize winners. Like something about the Jewish behavior and lifestyle works. You can't argue with that. So instead of being shy about it and kind of like pensive and quiet, loud, proud, out there, open, inviting people for Shabbat dinner, being more open as a community, having more allies, that's what we need. And at the end of the day, it might not end anti-Semitism, but my intention is to just make it a little less cool again. If I can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Noah. To conclude our discussion, uh, can you tell us if you're optimistic about the future of Israel? It's at a historic point now, or not, and why? I'm extremely optimistic about the future, not just of Israel, but of the Jewish people. Because we've been through this before. This is... The massacre of October 7th needs to be looked at through the prism of thousands of years of Jewish existence. It wasn't something that is an isolated event. This was one of those things that every few years happens to the Jews. And because we know it's one of those things that every few years happens to the Jews, we also know what happens to people that tried historically to mess with the Jews. They're not here, and we are. Am Yisrael always lives, always. Well, indeed, we're about to celebrate uh, Hanukkah soon, so the, the ancient Greeks are not really around anymore, and the others who try to and destroy Romans, Judaism. And the Avalaks, and the yeah. Lala, and the Lala, like That's all it. of them, they're like, yeah. That's it. We have to keep historical perspective. Well, Noah, uh, certainly on behalf of you and Watch and everyone here tonight, we are immensely admiring and grateful for everything that you do. Keep doing it. Thank you, Noah Tishbi. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.